Our uh, worship hour, we come together to sing praises to our Heavenly Father, to go before His throne in prayer and to partake the Lord's Supper, and now to have a uh, further time of uh, study together as we are going through this time of preaching. We are very thankful for our brethren that are assembled here, and we again invite those that are in our local area to come out and to be assembled with us uh, at the VFW Hall here in Ronan, Montana, 10 a.m. for a Bible class and our worship assembly that falls thereafter, so that you can uh, be with us here in person to receive this information and be edified with us. And if you have any questions or comments, to have those uh, to be addressed uh, at the appropriate time. But today we are continuing with our Matthew study, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 uh, excuse me, not 19 through 24, but 25 through 34, in bringing this chapter to a conclusion. But as we have said, not letting the chapter breaks uh, disconnect where we are going. In ending chapter 6, it's going to lead us right into the material of chapter 7. But today, when we are considering the information at hand, and we consider the time frame in which we are living, there is much to be anxious about. There are concerns, worries that are being thrown around us on a national scale, the fears of possible inflation moving into an area of recession. We have a war fighting that's going on in uh, Europe, in the East, with Ukraine and Russia, and we are that's having an effect on all of our goods. Gas is going up. Food prices are sky high as we're considering what is on the landscape and what people are trying to see about the future. And even setting this aside, moving, you know, moving from this on a national scale, just on a daily basis and on a personal scale, we have our own personal struggles and woes and problems that are setting us every, you know, besetting us every day. But this morning, we have already studied material that is going to help us in dealing with all of these concerns. That if, in fact, our eye is single and our eye is focused and aimed on the goal, and that being of the heavenly realm, that with the physical, Jesus has already told us, it's going to rust away. Moths are going to consume it. Our clothes are going to wear out. Shoes are going to wear out. Our physical bodies are wearing out. All of these things that we're worried about them can be taken from us in the blink of an eye. And yet, with all of that, it doesn't matter. Because we are laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. If we are, in fact, in the mode and in the mindset of de um, denying ourselves and being willing to help others with the goods that we have, what is the result of this? So as we said, there are spiritual benefits to come from these physical actions. That not only are we laying up treasures in heaven, that's in the future. But many people, when they think about Christianity and religion, they are curious and they're wondering, and rightfully so, what am I going to get out of it now? What is the benefit for me being here? I understand that this is going to get me to heaven or help me get to heaven but I need some comfort now. And that's where Jesus leads. The results of clear spiritual vision is less stress. And in our day and age with social media and the inventions of means and gifs or gifs, depending on how you want to pronounce it, you see this type of phrasing being thrown at us all around. Hashtag, I'm too blessed to be stressed. And we throw these phrases around to where we are in danger of them actually losing their significance and them losing their weight in our lives. That when we think about being a Christian, that's exactly right. I am way too blessed to be stressed with what's going on. 
Now, does that mean that I just cut myself away from everything that's going on and that I'm not staying up to date and I'm not, you know, thinking ahead? No, that's not what Jesus is discussing, and we'll address that when we get there. But religion, as we've been studying, religion, Christianity, that is simply ritual, does not present these types of realities for people. To where they, many of our religious friends, they will go into an assembly today and they will go into that assembly and for a brief moment, they can forget about their problems. But what happens when they leave that assembly? They go right back into what's ahead of them, what they're facing. But what we are doing instead, our assemblies are designed so that when we leave this place and we go back out into the world and we have to hear all of this, the comfort that we have here, we get to take with us. That what Jesus is presenting is designed to get us here. To where we can be at peace where we do not have to be anxious for tomorrow. So let's begin with our text. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He's already said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What we need to realize is that we will have some kind of master. Now, the problem is, is that as we go through this life, we oftentimes see ourselves as the master. Well, I'm serving self. I'm serving my own desires. When in reality, that is serving sin and that's serving the devil. And you're not serving God. Either we will be controlled by God or we will be controlled by my materials. That's specifically in this context. And that is what Paul mentioned as well in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, and also in verse 25. Notice this. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, but notice this point. Neither were they thankful. To be an ingrate is not Christianity. If we are to be a Christian, then we need to make sure that we are thankful. And when we are thankful for what we have, then what about the things we don't have? When you count your blessings and you name them one by one, what about the things that you do not have? You don't worry yourself with those things. You don't consider those things. And so the reflection is, be thankful for what you have. But notice, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. What did they end up doing? Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature themselves. Me and my desires, they worship the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They lacked an appreciation for God. And if you do not have a proper appreciation for God, then you will have the improper attitude towards your material things. If you do not see them as being a blessing from God and thus to be used for the furtherance of His kingdom, and for His glorification, then what will I do? I will use my material goods, and I will worship and serve myself. But the reality, as we said, is that mankind, we, 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 we will be mastered by something. They worshiped and served the creature instead of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, you have it being described about those that are traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. That is the danger that we find ourselves in. We live in a day and an age that's all about entertainment. We have all of these streaming services. Social media, we have all of these games, we have sports, and we have all these different things that are designed throughout the realm of entertainment. And what's that for? There's nothing wrong with them within themselves, but if we 
focus on those things and we simply desire or we focus on, we become lovers of pleasure of what this earth, earth holds and what this earth can give, then we will love that more than we will be lovers of God. To where we will be split, we will be divided. This is because of an emphasis on material and the convenient things of life. This is the danger that we all face. We have to make the decision. We have to make the choice. Who am I going to serve? In Romans chapter 6, Paul says that through being obedient or obeying from the heart to the form of doctrine that was delivered unto them, they no longer were the servants of sin, but were now the servants of righteousness. And what Jesus is showing is if you choose the right master, if you choose to serve God and not the things of this earth, then there will be peace. We mentioned verse 24 so as to get us to where we are in chapter, in chapter 6 and verse 25. No man can serve two masters, okay? What's the conclusion? Therefore. What is the therefore, therefore? It's tying everything that Jesus has mentioned together. This is the conclusion. This is the summation. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Now, as we said, Jesus is not saying, do not plan ahead. Jesus is not condemning forethought. Because even in Luke chapter 12, uh, 14, verse 28, he lays out the illustration of what do you think of a person, what do you think of a man that goes out to build a tower, to build a city, but does not plan out effectively to make sure he has what he needs so as to complete it? Well, you would think that man a fool. And so Jesus teaches and he says, count the cost. So it's not the idea that we're looking ahead into the future and that we're making our plans. That's not what's being addressed here. To take no thought, and notice for the elements that we're discussing of your life, well, what about what elements of life? What you shall eat, what you shall drink, or your body, what you shall put on. Here we're talking about the basic necessities of life. He says, take no thought for these things which to take no thought literally can be translated, and I'm sure some of your translations have it in there. Do not be anxious about these things. Do not stress over these things. Literally means do not be distracted by these things. Because that's what he's already addressed. Let your eye be single. Let your eye be fixed on a goal. And if you're fixed on that goal, you won't be distracted. But what happens when distraction comes in? When distraction comes in and your attention is divided, you're not able to accomplish what you set out to do. We live in a day and an age that says, well, if I don't have all of these things actually going on, then I'm not being productive. We have the idea of multitasking so as to get things done. But they've done studies. Nobody is able to multitask. Now, you have people that are fooling themselves into thinking that they can handle it all and do it all. But eventually, if they keep that up, something is going to fall through the cracks you're going to lose sight of something that's needing to be done. Why? Because I'm trying to handle all of these affairs. So, the idea is that we're not being anxious, we're giving, not giving thought to these things, we're not being controlled by all of these elements. And they're not being overemphasized. They're not being put out of balance. Because where does the stress of life really come in? By doing too much 
with too little time. And that's where the anxiety and the stress ends up coming in. Well, I've got this meeting. I've got this report due, business lunch, conference call, review contract. Then you've got family matters. There's a soccer game, school play, pick up the kids, PTA meeting, meeting got to get dinner ready. And all of this distraction is where the anxiety comes in. Now let's go back to our beginning, si beginning slide. What is all of this? It's distraction. These are the distractions of life that get us caught, that we get caught up in and ends up producing more stress. But what about if our eye is single? What if our eye is fixed on a goal and we're not distracted, we're not divided? What we end up doing is that we can actually end up magnifying our needs. And oftentimes we label needs when in fact they are non-essentials. The non-essentials of life can actually become essentials in our mind. And thus we end up serving another master. And in serving another master, or let's just put it into that realm. Let's say you have two jobs with two bosses. While you're at work with one boss, your mind is distracted over here with, well, what's my other boss going to need? What's my other job going to withhold or uh, have holding in store for me? To where you're not focused on what's going on at, at the task at hand. And that's what life is for us. Either we are going to be focused on the things of heaven and be so focused to where we can kick back, we can let go of these physical areas, these basic needs, food, water, clothing. And Jesus says it produces peace. That in fact, these things will be taken care of. And if these things will be taken care of, the basic necessities of life, then what about the other things? They'll be taken care of as well. It's just keeping everything in perspective. Not allowing our minds to be divided. It's just like you're sitting at home and you're trying to read a book and you're trying to study. But then you're jumping back and forth between your laptop and your phone and all these different things. How far are you going to get in your study? You're not going to get very far. And then what does that do? Well, I haven't been studying. That produces stress. The task at hand. Take no thought of it. Be not anxious. As we've already said, take no thought. Be not anxious. It's the very same thing that Paul ends up putting an emphasis on in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. We see just how important this is and how deadly the struggle can end up being. Paul writes to these brethren. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But look at what he says. But this one thing I do. When it came to the mindset of Paul, he realized the importance of the singleness of I, of the single I, removing distraction. I'm not out here diving into all these different elements and I've got 10 things that I'm doing. I've got this one thing that's on my mind. There is one matter that is controlling his life. There is the one principal thing of his life that has center and focus. And he's encouraging this to these brethren. Now, these are not just empty words that Paul is writing to these brethren. And I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be an animation in here. But when he's writing to the brethren at Philippi, and he's telling to them, listen, I've got this one thing in mind, and it's producing a peace that's beyond comprehension, that's beyond understanding, to where even when outward circumstances are the way that they are, that there is peace of mind. And that's illustrated in Acts chapter 16, verses 23 through 25. When they had laid many stripes upon them, 
they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. What does a singleness of eye, a singleness of mind do for us? It produces a peace to where Paul and Silas are in prison. And what are they doing? They're not wringing their hands and worrying and stressing about what are we going to do. They are praying and singing praises. They're at peace. Why? Because their mind, their eye is fixed on the goal. Acts chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. Here's the apostle Peter. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Acts 16, we have Paul and Silas, they're singing and praying. Peter is in prison after John has already been beheaded. And what is Peter doing? He's sleeping. Peter, how can you sleep at a time like this? It seems like Peter's learning his lesson from being in the boat with Jesus. There's a storm all around us and the water is coming in the boat. And what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. And remember the question that Peter asked him. Lord, do you not care that we are in this storm? And Jesus arose and calmed the sea. And Peter is holding on to that experience. And here he is in prison. Very like, and we know from the text that Herod has the same plan for Peter that he had for John. It pleased the people that he beheaded John. Now he's got Peter in prison. Prison, or excuse me, Peter, more than likely you're going to lose your head. Well, I think I'll take a nap. What produces this? It's what we're studying in the Beatitudes. It's what we're studying with this Sermon on the Mount. That in denying ourselves in a proper aspect and relationship view of our material things, we will be ready to dispense of them so that if we actually have them taken from us, it's not the end of the world. Now just consider what all Peter's leaving behind. Sure, he's leaving behind physical, material things. But Peter was an elder. And we know the qualifications to be an elder is you have to be married with children. And here's Peter in prison, about to lose his life. And he's sleeping. Do you not care? Of course we care. But the eye is single. The eye is focused. And in being focused on the goal, when faced with insurmountable odds, we still realize that the odds are in our favor. We have these illustrations, and we have Paul presenting this one thing I do. I'm not distracted by all these other things. And then Paul writes this in Philippians 4 and verse 7. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, notice, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What is the peace of God? 
It's what Jesus is discussing here. Food, water, clothing. Does God care? Yes, he does care. And that that peace is to keep our hearts, but not only our hearts, is to keep our minds. Philippians 4 and verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. As we said, these are not just empty words that Paul is presenting to these brethren at Philippi. Philippi is the very town where Paul was in prison. Acts chapter 16 and the conversion account of the Philippian jailer. That's where all of this is happening and Paul is writing this information to these brethren. They knew all about it. But there we see the, the emphasis and the importance of bringing things to our remembrance. Here are these brethren, and they lived through this with Paul. Yeah, Paul, we know all about this, but I'm still going to write to you about it. Because you don't need to forget it. This is the congregation in the town where Paul was in prison. So this is not just idle talk. This is not just filler to put into the letter. He went through it, and they knew it. And they are seen with his example. This is how you handle it. That in whatever state I am, to be content. Whether I'm in prison or I'm set free, I'm fine because I know that God cares for me. What is being produced here? With the singleness of I, we have concentration. Our minds are fixed on a purpose. Our mind is set on things that God says that we are to be focused on. And what does that then produce? Out of concentration, then comes commitment. A commitment to righteousness, loyalty to Him. Out of that commitment comes contentment. With whatever there is, I'm satisfied and that I'm at peace. Notice also how it's illustrated in Luke's account. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 41, with the situation of Mary and Martha, notice what Jesus says here. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful. Same word from Matthew chapter 6. Thou art careful, anxious. But notice he adds a word. Notice what this carefulness, this anxiousness, what it produces. And troubled. Why are so many people troubled? Stressed? There's anxiousness. Why is there anxiousness? Because there's a divided mind. Look at what he says. Notice, you are anxious and troubled. Why? About many things. There's the distraction. But notice what he says about Mary. But one thing is needful. You want to get rid of anxiousness, anxiety, get rid of stress and trouble? Don't be distracted. What James writes about with a double-minded mind or a double-minded man being unstable in all of his ways, this is what we're talking about. You're anxious and troubled because of many things. Your spirit, your soul is divided. You're trying to live in two separate worlds. You're trying to serve two masters. But if you would just serve the one... Focus on the one. Then we can remove this. There's the contrast. And illustration of exactly what Jesus is teaching. This is the characteristic of, of anxiety and trouble. 
Look at the distraction and the divided mind. Now, going back to Matthew 6, Jesus says, Behold, look, pay attention, take it into view. The fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are they not much better than they? Now just consider, why bring up birds and not squirrels as the illustration? Because squirrels have the tendency to scavenge and to hold over. They hide things, saving up for the next year. But you see, birds, they don't do that. They just flutter around. They jump from branch to branch. Does it really look like a bird has a care in the world? But you look at a squirrel, you can, can, you can tell. A squirrel is busy. They're running here and there, and they're looking. They're searching. But the birds, they just go about their business. They just go about their day. And do you think a bird is really worried that they're sitting on a branch and they're contemplating, well, where are we going to get a worm tomorrow? No. With birds, they live day to day. And is that not what Jesus illustrated in the model prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Who are we leaning on? Who are we trusting? Where is our focus? Where is our aim? So as to provide. Well, we're focused on God. Well, then you don't need to worry about this. The point God has provided with their labor to get their food. God has made the earth in such a way that there are worms all over the place. All you have to do is just take a shovel, dig up a little bit of earth, and man, there's your supply. And so, since God has given us a brain that is far superior of that of the birds, we should then be able to see that if God is going to take care of them, that He will take care of us. That if he has that kind of love and that kind of concern for them, then he has the same for us. And the very idea that we have Jesus saying, take no thought for your life. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, or store up in barns. Does worry lengthen days? And I see what's happening here. I've missed a, I've missed a slide. Where the next question comes in to where Jesus asked them, can any man give thought so as to add a cubit to their stature? Can any of these things actually bring about any type of production that is going to be a benefit to your life? He raises the question, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Just think about that question. Which of you, by taking thought, worrying about it, anxious over it, stressing over it, can add a cubit unto his stature? The word cubit actually carries with it, it's the Greek word, hey like ea, from the same as 2245, and it is describing maturity in years or size. One's age when describing stature. So it's not talking about me literally increasing my height. We're talking about lengthening days, extending your life. Oh, and I see what I did here. It's right here in the middle. Does giving thought, worrying, becoming anxious, does it help your life? Can you add length to your days by living this way? 
No. We know all too well that worry, stress, it does not lengthen days, lengthen somebody's life, it shortens it. High blood pressure and all these different things that end up happening. And why is that even necessary? It's not. Look at the examples. When it comes to your basic needs, they're able to be met. Verse 28, he says, <clears throat> after raising that question, and why take ye thought for raiment? So we've moved on from food now to clothing. Consider. So it's behold, now it's consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If God can cover a flower in such great splendor, and you and I are made in the very image of God, why would He not clothe you just like that flower? And as we are considering these points, the struggle that we have today, and it's not only a struggle that we have today, but it's the same struggle that they would have been going through, that all of God's people go through. Does God care about us? Or is God simply this being that has created us and He's put Himself miles and miles and miles away from us? Because we cannot see Him. We cannot hear Him today verbally. We cannot feel Him. And He is not acting directly in our lives as He did during the first century, where Jesus, the Son of God, is walking in their very midst. How do we know that He cares for us? Many people think that God really does not care for them. But if we take that wrong type of care from verse 25 and we put it here in verse 30. And we will see that, yes, if you replace the word clothe, if He would clothe them, will He not clothe you? And you put the word care in there. Jesus is preparing them and He's emphasizing to us. God does care about His creation. And He cares about those that will be in His kingdom. And Jesus addresses this problem with the closing phrase where He says to His disciples, O ye of little faith. Now notice, He does not say, O ye of no faith. It's little faith. It's an inadequate faith. It's a lack of faith. And this phrase ends up being used four more times, or excuse me, three more times, four in total, including this, this section, in the book of Matthew. And in each time, we find out what produces or what allows our faith to grow smaller. Notice this. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26. This is where Jesus is asleep in the boat. The storm has hit the sea. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now we're told in the Revelation that those that are fearful are going to be amongst those that find their reward in the second death, in the lake which fire, uh, that burns with fire. This is the kind of fear that's going to find us there. It's not fear itself. God has given us the emotion of fear. Fear is what allows us to calculate and to determine, do I want to take this risk or not? 
But there is a kind of fear that controls us and that takes over us and causes our faith to dwindle. And that's what's happening here. O oh, ye of little faith. Why? Because you're fearful. You're afraid. And you're allowing that, fra- that, uh, that uh, fear to conquer you. Again, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, This is Peter walking out on the water. Notice again, it's not no faith. Peter had some faith. But what produced this inadequate faith, this little faith? Wherefore didst thou doubt? Why would you doubt? You see Jesus out here walking on the water. Why would you think you would not be able to walk on the water? And what was the reason? When he took his eyes off of the Lord and he saw the wind and he saw the waves, he doubted. When the singleness of eye was gone, And he started looking around, and then comes the distraction. And what what enters in? Doubt. Now, we just think about all of those distractions that we saw on the very first slide. And how, to a large degree, we are going through some suffering. And as we're going through that suffering, is it not easy for doubt to creep in and for us to question? Why is God letting this happen? Does He not care about us? That is what produces this little faith. And then again in Matthew 16, 18, which when Jesus perceived, He said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. What produces a littleness of faith, a lack of faith, is when we start looking to our own understanding. That when we consider the ways of Christianity, the ways of Christianity are backwards to how the world says things operate, the way things are supposed to go. And when they reasoned among themselves and they could not understand what Jesus was presenting here about bread, when he said, fear the leaven of the Pharisees, and they got huddled up together and they started reaching their own conclusions that was not in line with what God had said, it produces this littleness of faith. And what does that do? That creates worry. That creates stress and that creates anxiety. When Jesus says that if we are focused and single with I, no matter what comes, there's peace of mind. That there's a contentment. In verse 31 through 33, again, Jesus uses the phrase, he uses the word, therefore. So he's not done building his conclusion. Therefore, take no thought. Do not be careful. Do not be full of care. Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Really focus in on the words seek and need. Both show a failure in recognition that God knows our needs and that he cares about our needs. And we may miss the emphasis on how distinct 
This makes us from everyone else around us. That we are not consumed by these needs. But instead, we are consumed by verse 33. It's not the physical world that consumes us and its things, but instead it is verse 33 that consumes us and it's the things of God. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In a nutshell, what Jesus is presenting here is like a person that says, I eat, sleep, breathe, drink, and you can fill in the blank. And we know people that are like this. They are fanatics. We would look at them and we would see their devotion to, let's say it's a particular sports team, and we would think that they were nuts of the amount of time, money, strength, and energy that they spend on whatever their passion is. And that people are to see with us that same type of fanatic behavior but it's with the kingdom of God. That they see us and the fact that we are so consumed with the things and the affairs and the cares of the church. And I'm sure to a lot of people, they do look at us strangely. Into how much time and energy that we put over into the spiritual things of life, but what else matters? What is it that's going to carry us through? What is it that's going to bring us peace? We eat, drink, and are clothed with the things of the kingdom. This is what we live for. And it will affect us. To seek means to search for to demand or to crave after. This is what we are to crave every day. And if we crave this and nothing else, there will be no distraction. There will be no trouble. There will be no turmoil. Thus, there will be peace. It is an unceasing quest. It is an unquenchable desire that we've just got to have it. Now, does the kingdom drive us like that? What keeps us going? What gets us up out of bed in the mornings? You know, if you don't have anything there, to get you up in the morning, why get up? Why do people get up and go to work? Well, I have to provide for my family. What is it that keeps us going in our spiritual walk? What keeps us being Christians? Why go through the things that we endure? There's a benefit. We're laying up treasure in heaven, but not only are we laying up treasure in heaven, but we have peace while we're here. We can be content to where we are. We are committed to the call and to the purpose. And producing a singleness of mind. So as we conclude with verse 34, he then stretches it out. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Do not be anxious today. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. We have the tendency of constantly being in the mode of and in the phase of, well, here's what I've got to do tomorrow. We've got to do this tomorrow. We've got to do that tomorrow. We've got to do that tomorrow. But what about the things of today? If your brain is constantly in tomorrow, how are you supposed to get anything done today? You don't. You're distracted. 
So what is Jesus actually teaching us, telling us? Live life in a single day. Give us this day our daily bread. Just simply live day to day and take care of today because tomorrow will take care of tomorrow. And how many times we get to worrying about things in tomorrow that don't even come to pass? And then we go back to James chapter 4. What is your life? Why are you worried about tomorrow when tomorrow may not even come? Be focused on the here and now. So he emphasizes again for us. Again, do not be anxious. And in our minds, that's one of those things where it's easier said than done. And that's right. This takes practice. You have to work at this. And guess how you get to work at it? You get to work at it when troubles come up. I was joking around with Jordan over the weekend how that I hate sermons where I have to make personal application. I've had some events come up in the past week where I am having to work this out. To not be anxious. To not worry about it. To not let it mess up my present day, my current day, and to be able to be in the moment and handle the task at hand. It happens to all of us. And it's when we're able to view these moments and to see them for what they are. This is a chance for me to practice that God cares for me. This will work itself out. So again, he says, do not be anxious. Again, this is not discussing the foresight. God practices foresight. That's what providence is. Providence is God planning ahead so as to intertwine his will into the daily affairs. So it's not a matter of foresight, planning ahead. It's when you find yourself in trial, like Martha. You're anxious. You're troubled. It's because of many things. Focus on the task at hand, and what will that do to anxiety? It'll lessen it. Each day will have its own troubles and its own trials. I cannot handle yesterday's troubles. They're already done. And guess what? I cannot anticipate tomorrow's. I don't know what tomorrow holds. So what do I deal with? I deal with what I have. And in dealing with what I have going on today, I can be at peace. And certainly with what we're doing today, we need to be focused on this. Our minds need to be here and not already planning out, well, what am I going to do when I leave here? What do I have on my schedule? What am I needing to get done? Your mind is divided from what's going on here. And guess what that does? While you're here, you're antsy. You're troubled and you're stressed. Why, Martha? Because my mind is fixed on many things that I've got to do when I get out of here. Why are our brethren so time conscious when it comes to our assemblies? Oh, well, I got things I got to do when I get out of here. You're making my point. You're making the Lord's point. But this is what he's offering us, the ability to be able to slow down. Isn't that what a lot of people are wishing for right now? Just wish that we could slow down for a bit. And Jesus says, if you're a Christian, you can slow down. You can take some time to consider the lilies. Smell the roses. And be at peace knowing that God will take care of it. 
That is what Christ is offering for those in His kingdom. For us as Christians, as being the children of God. So why would a person not want to be a Christian today? In the midst of all the trouble that we have on our horizon. And then to just go through it with the mindset. Knowing God loves us. That while we cannot hear Him, we cannot see Him, taste Him, smell Him, feel Him. We know that He's there and that He's watching over us. But as we said, Jesus is laying this out for those that are in the kingdom. If you are not in the kingdom, then what is your life going to be filled with? It's going to be filled with stress, worry, anxiety, because you're not going to be following these things. So the invitation is for those that are not members of the Lord's church, that are not members of the church of Christ. This is why we are here. If you're not a Christian, you need to be one. Because this is what the Lord is offering. Heaven when we die, but peace while we're here. And for those of us that are here, that are members of the Lord's church, let's always be encouraged. Let's always be reminded. God does care about us. And the way that we need to recognize that is when we show care and concern for one another. Jesus said, the world will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. So we need each other. We need to be here. We need this brotherhood. We need this fellowship. And we need this time of remembrance. So whether a person needs to put on Christ in baptism for the first time or we being brethren and our strength is growing weak, we're allowing ourselves to be anxious and be troubled and be full of care, now is the time where we can fix all of that. Lay that at His feet. Lay that burden at His feet. And then we go on our way. So as we sing this song, anybody have